Hey guys, it's Norm from Tested. I'm here at Thunder Hill Raceway, north of San Francisco. But at this racetrack today, you're not gonna find your standard race cars, because today is the first autonomous vehicle track day. It's all autonomous vehicles or semi-autonomous vehicles on this track. A bunch of companies in the Bay Area have brought their cars, things that they've been building in their garages, not your big Teslas or BMWs, putting on custom hardware, custom software to test out their cars. Let's go check it out. Josh, it's great to be here. How are you doing? I am good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. So tell us a little bit about this event, how it came about, and what the goals are here. So my idea is to, to start an uh, autonomous racing series. I think that um, the technology is just about getting to the point where people are actually going to be able to start making these uh robots in the garage, in the, uh, in a school, right there. The, the technology has gotten so far so fast that, um, that that it's almost doable. It's not just the Teslas out there who need hundreds of millions of dollars to build cars. There, there are themselves. two guys in who built a, a self-driving go-kart in a garage here today, and they're hopefully going to try for the first autonomous lap by hobbyists tomorrow. So what are those technologies that have become more affordable? And is it more of a hardware or a software? challenge now? Uh, well, it's a combination of both, but uh, and you should totally interview them, uh, but uh, uh, there's all different sorts of technologies that are applicable and people are trying to figure out how they fit together and it's so this is sort of this is less about racing and cars and more of an engineering problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so people are figuring out what works, what doesn't work, what they can try, trying different things. The track is a different environment than the street. In, in a bunch of ways, it's more complicated because it's 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 curvy and vicious, and 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 you're at speed. You're but there's at also speed. You're, these are cars going at high speed on a racetrack. Where, whereas uh, uh, there are no pedestrians, there's no cross traffic, so there's it's a different challenge. So that might lead to different solutions. Uh, you know, different problems lead to different solutions, which will let us end up, you know, finding new things to build. And is the goal to do multiple of these events so that you're going to have autonomous cars actually compete against each other? I, I would like to make figure out how to make both the environment and the, the challenge so that people can, can build stuff that competes. Wow. And what what would be make this weekend a perfect weekend for you? And uh, what would the Nobody the, crashing. Nobody crashing. Safety first, never taking a holiday. But what I, do you I hope paint size up? Yeah, these I, teams take away. This is this is so people can meet each other, can uh, a lot of these people like I've, I've they've exchanged email but never met. Um, they are uh, uh, figuring out what the, some of them have never been to a track before, so you know never. So it's, so it's it's basically this is like the first time, just sort of building the first connections and the first uh, the first sort of matrix for this stuff to exist in. Literally taking it out of the garage and the workshop and putting it on the road. Field exactly. Test. Well, great. Thank you for setting up this event. I want to chat with some of these builders and I uh, want to have a great day out here. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Great to see you here, Chris. Uh, people, a lot of people know you from 3DR, you work with drones, uh, your book Long Tail. Uh, so why are you here? Why have you been building an uh, autonomous car? Uh, as you know, the answer is always because we can. <laughs> <laughs> Never ask why. Um, well, you know, the, the interesting thing is that, so Carl um, and his son built the car and um, and it was, you know, from scratch, electric uh, go-kart. Um, in many ways, kind of using his company's tools, but to do something this company doesn't do. And I thought oh, no, I don't have it was cool, but it needed a brain. So we would do the same thing. We would use my company's tools, but doing something that we don't do. So we took a drone autopilot uh -huh. and stuck it in there with some, you know, wires and a little tweaking of code. And um, now this is... This is a, um, you know, these small cars, um, these rovers, have been flying our, you know, driving our code for a long time. But we've never really gone fast. We've never gone out of sight. We've always done it in sort of a, like a spark fun autonomous vehicle competition. Mm -hmm. um, we want to see what happens when you start scaling it up to, you know, human-sized vehicles. Um, and then maybe 
looking at, you know, observing other cars and maybe using sort of competitive strategies to pass and then, who knows, maybe we'll weaponize it and, you know. <laughs> so the technologies of things that made drones, commercial drones today, consumer yeah. drones possible, yeah. cheaper IMUs, better software, all of that kind of is applicable to Absolutely. cars. I mean, literally, we just take our drone, we, uh, you, you take our, our drone autopilot, in this case, it's called Pixar. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when you when you you know when you open up the software, it gives you a choice: which vehicle do you want? Do you want to be a copter? Do you want to be a plane? Do you want to be a rover? Rover's just an option. So we just press right. the button, and it becomes a rover. Now that's the easy part. Uh, the hard part is making it a smarter rover. Situational so, awareness. Situational awareness. So, so out of the box, it does GPS, and we're not doing anything really fancy. We're doing differential GPSs, or two GPSs, um, and of course we have to interface with this you know kind of larger car. So there's some, as you can see, a big old servo drives the. Mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't the hard part. The hard part is going to be bringing in things like computer vision, LIDAR, radar, you know, we already had sonar, um, uh, visual odometry, um, things like that. And that's, and that's where you're starting to move beyond, well, it's, it's, it's something that's being done in the air as well. Um, but because we have space, we can actually just throw a lot of sensors on it without having to worry about weight power consumption, things like that. So I think it might be a good platform for exploring sense and avoid using using like throwing every possible sensor we can imagine at it and kind of letting the statistics work it out. And that software feeds back to your business in terms exactly. of putting that technology into drones. Exactly. So I think of this in the same way that these little these little rovers were a test bed for the big cart, the cart is a test bed ultimately for back for the drones. Uh. It's just a place to put lots of sensors where you can gather tons of data. And we just, you know, we, right now we, we have, we have, you know, relatively small processors, but, you know, we're moving up to the you know, higher end ones, um, you know, Raspberry Pi 3s, mm -hmm. Odrons, Androids, you know, video boards and things like that. So, you know, we have this bounty that Moore's Law has given us, incredible computer, computational power. We have all these great sensors out there. Um, and one of the nice things about doing with a cart is that when things go wrong, it doesn't fall out of the sky. Right, absolutely. So on a situation like this where you're taking on high speed on a track where it's not your standard street environment. Well, this is easy. Yeah, this is, is it easier too or easy. harder? It's, it's well, easy. no, it's, it's, okay. it's too easy because we're the only car on the track. The track's like 30 feet wide. Mm -hmm. You know, GPS is probably good enough. Now, um, where it's going to get harder is when there's other cars on the track. Yep. Um, if we are, if we actually get so fast, we need to actually optimize it. So you know, maybe skiddings, mm. you know, around curves, things like that. Um, and that's more sensors on here. That's going to be more sensors. So, so I think with plain old GPS. I wouldn't be amazed if we actually finished the course with just standard GPS today. So a positional tracking system like GPS and IMUs, GPS, yeah, computer yeah. vision, those are the kind of your three. I mean, inputs. really, it's not much more than, I mean, we, we have IMUs, but we hardly use them because we know wow. it's pretty much flat. It's basically a compass and GPS. Wow. I mean, we're, we, those, are the, those are the two main sensors right. in this case. So I think we can finish the track with a compass and GPS. Um, I think we uh, would not finish the track if it were, for example, narrower. We wouldn't finish the track if there were like obstacles or other cars in the way. And we probably wouldn't finish the track if we were going 180 miles an hour. Now, are you incorporating the track data beforehand or is that being collected? Uh, he's data logging it right now. So we don't trust the maps, the maps that are all wrong. And I know they download, they offered us a, uh, a map file that's mm -hmm. accurate, but we're just so gonna test it ourselves. And um, then with every run, every run gets... we data log, and actually it's learning, so it's got learning algorithms. So as it as it goes, it's um, it's uh, calibrating the compass to agree with the GPS, and uh, by the time he's done, we should have enough information that we can do an autonomous run by itself. So if initially he's going to do it driving, mm -hmm. then he's going to do it not driving, but his hand on the kill switch. If that goes well, then out comes Carl, in goes Clyde, the uh, the, the, the stuffed gorilla. And um, wait bye bye. Wow, a lot of companies here are putting or designing Thomas cars based around real cars, like yeah. commercial cars. You guys are a go kart. What are the benefits of that? Is it just costs? Is it because then... we didn't have an extra car? <laughs> okay. My wife, my wife, would be kind of annoyed if I took her car. Yeah, we just, we just, this is just fun for us. We're not a company. We're just, we're just, you know, two dads who did projects with their kids, and by day we happen to have day jobs that were relevant to this. So we try to do it cheap and easy. Um, it's more complex than just like an RC truck or something like that. Mm. Um, but it's not as complex as a physical uh, car. And um, if it crashes, we rebuild it. And for people out there who want to build their own autonomous RC truck, for example, all that code is available? That's all available. It's called RG Rover. Um, it's all free. It's all open source. Um, you just, um, RG Rover, I think, .org. Um, but it's part of the RG Pilot uh, set, uh, part of the drone code mm -hmm. um, stack. 
And uh, this is the same code that's been winning spark funds, autonomous vehicle competition for years mm. um, at, the, at the smaller size. Um, and I think what we're trying to prove here is that it scales up. Go-kart today, who knows what tomorrow. Very cool, well, good luck on the track and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. George, great to meet you. So uh, you run Kama and you guys make uh, autonomous platform for cars, existing cars. Tell me a little bit about Kama. Um, well, first off, I wouldn't say platform. We make a self-driving kit uh, that we're going to sell by the end of the year for under $1,000. End of this year? End of this year, for under $1,000 that will users will be able to install this on their car if they have a supported car. And they'll be able to drive in highway and in traffic. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty ambitious. So you started off on this Acura, um, and then you're also working with uh, this electric car, yep. this Wego. Yep. Uh, what does the kit come with? I mean, is it, it's both software and hardware, I imagine. You guys are doing the software. Yes. Is it off-the-shelf hardware? Um, unannounced. Unannounced. Unannounced to exactly what the kit will be, but we have said that it will be about as easy to install as setting up a piece of IKEA furniture. Interesting. So how does this car drive autonomously? I guess might be a better way to ask. Uh, cameras and radar. So there's two systems, situational awareness, cameras. I saw on the Wego you have cameras mounted have cameras all, all over on around the it. Yep. Um, that's a vision system, radar, another type of vision system. Are you guys using GPS IMUs or? Um, so currently, no. Currently, nothing on our car uses localization to drive. But in the shipping product, we plan to have localization as a backup. Mm. Um, I mean, there's no reason not to have it. It's very cheap. And so my understanding is you want to design this kit to get people to be able to go to work, commute on freeways without having their hands on the wheel, right? Yes. So what are the challenges of that? I and mean, what, what, that's a very specific environment. No, it's not that specific. Like, it is the majority use case of driving. Most mm. people who drive are commuting, and most people who are commuting are on freeways. Um, so that's the, you know, and most people, if you're driving, you're driving out in mountain roads, you don't want a self-driving car. You're driving the freeway to work, you want a self-driving car. So there's enough of a known known quantity in that environment. Yeah. You know that most freeways, they have lane markers. Yes. Other cars in front of you, yeah. those, those distances are all, all known. Yep. Um, and it's also, um, yeah, you know, you're not going to run into too many unexpected situations in the freeway. Whereas in the city, you can run into the most unexpected, crazy things. Pedestrians, traffic, yep. uh, street lights. Pedestrians that. move everywhere, right? There's no pedestrians on the highway. Right. I also noticed the cars have you have screens inside. You have LCD course, screens, so and that's part of the kit as well. No, I wish. I wish. Uh, we do love the LCD screen. It's a 21.5 inch touchscreen. It's 4.5 inches bigger than Tesla's. So what is it? What's the point of that screen in, in your system? Oh well, so we like to you know listen to Spotify and watch Netflix and watch right. YouTube while so we're it's, driving. It's, it's, a it's basically you have a computer built in and that's the display yeah. for the computer. We use that for development. Eventually, we may one day offer something that has a large screen, but it will not be in the shipping kit by the end of this year. No, mm. not quite that large. Right, and imagine as you're testing the car, using the screen to provide feedback, yes. visual information. You can also pull to the side of the road and write programs oh, if okay. you'd like to yeah. make some changes to how the car works. So basically there is a computer in there. It's right there. Right, how much computational power do oh. you need for this type of vision system? So our computer is a gaming PC. We okay. have, we have a, uh, it's got a Core i7-6700K, which is like the best single thread mm -hmm. performance you can buy. It's got a GTX 970, which is a mid-tier graphics card. Do you need graphics power? Do you need that computer? For, we use for GPUs those? for neural networks. Ah, yeah, okay. uh, we use GPUs to run the neural networks that make the decisions on how, how to drive the car. Mm. And then, because you're using also camera systems, larger camera systems, I imagine yep. wide-angle lenses, mm -hmm. a lot of the existing autonomous car systems don't do so well in different lighting conditions. Yep. Reflectivity, is that something you guys are thinking about? And we have we have lighting condition issues as well. Uh, there's some uh, times of day that are just really bad. Are right. uh, they also dusk? You know, is the number one human accident time. Right. Um, it's hard to see at dusk because the sun is low in the sky, so it's in your frame as well as the road. And there's such a uh, disparity between the brightness of this and the darkness of this that it's it's the most difficult time of the day. To is there a way to solve that in software or to put ND filters, hardware? What, what's well, the solution? So yeah, um, the camera that we're shipping hopefully we'll have much higher dynamic range than the camera that's on the car right now. Mm -hmm. There are also software tricks you can do, like light frame, dark frame, which is you take one highly exposed frame and one not so exposed frame, and then you merge them in software. But this is quite difficult to do. This is how your cell phone does HDR. Yeah. But this is quite difficult to do in a moving vehicle because you all your frames are taken. 30 FPS, 60 FPS, you need all that data. You need the data, but even, even if you could physically do it, the problem is you can't, um, well, your images are different because they were taken at different 
time. Yeah. You're not like you're holding the camera still to take two pictures. You would need to do some type of syncing up or adjustment of the frame to, yep. to match it up to actually make that data useful and relevant. Um, now, you mentioned camera. Is the most important camera the one in the front, looking yes. at the traffic in Without front of you? That, uh, in fact, the kit we ship might only have front. So without a rear camera, I mean, you lose a little bit of situational awareness. Yes, you do. Uh, um, so our system is not a level four autonomy system. Mm -hmm. uh, the driver has to be aware and in control of the vehicle at all times. It's a lot more like a actually good ADAS system, more along the lines of Tesla Autopilot than anything else. Right. Um, Tesla Autopilot also only has one forward-facing camera, one forward-facing radar. Right, and how much uh, testing have you guys actually done on the road, and where is it at right now? Um, we've probably spent 200 hours in autonomy mode. Wow. And then you guys are out here, of course, on the racetrack. So these are, are these speeds? Like it's a different environment. There's no it's other traffic. It's a completely different environment. So what are you trying to, what kind of data are you trying to get out of this? We are trying to, at this event, do a 100% autonomous lap. Um, we're not trying to do a fast 100% autonomous lap because our car is very, uh, it has high torque limits on the steering wheel. Um, this isn't quite what you want for racing, but this is definitely what you want for highway because a lot of people have this fear that the car is going to decide to swerve right. Mm -hmm. Our car is actually incapable of doing that. We block that, and we block it so well that even for the racetrack, we can't do it. And then you also mentioned, as the kit comes out, it'll be for compatible cars. Yes. Is that compatibility, is that determined by how well your system can tap into um, navigation and driving? We're going to have a list. Uh, we don't need navigation, but how well we can tap into the car, yeah. Okay. That's how well we can drive the car by wire is what determines what cars will be supported. Awesome. We can look forward to that by the end of this year. End of this year, under $1,000. Easy to install as a piece of IKEA furniture. <laughs> That's a lot of promises. Thank hey, you, George. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. Look forward to it. Cool. Thanks. Thanks.